one. Blog Talk Radio. Welcome, everybody, to the Iran Brooks Show on this, uh, at least in Puerto Rico, beautiful uh, Saturday, uh, uh, the 1st of December. It's hard to believe, but it's already December 2018 is almost done. I mean, that's just mind-boggling to me. I hope you're all having a uh, great weekend. And, um, you know, <sighs> Silicon Valley is... is um, Full of billionaires. Um, one of the things these billionaires have done in the last couple of decades is start giving away a lot of their money. And I think for a lot of Americans, this this charity that the billionaires are expressing is viewed as a positive. Uh, I think Bill Gates has basically redeemed this public image from this horrific CEO of the largest company in the world. By the way, this week, for the first time in a long, long time, Microsoft is, again, the largest company in the world based on market cap. Uh, it, it surpassed Apple. And, and in the days where Bill, Ga Bill Gates was the CEO of Microsoft and um, the CEO of the largest company in the world, he, he was viewed, he had a very negative perception by the American public and uh, certainly by the intellectuals. And I think I saw some survey thing recently where he's like one of the most beloved people out there, certainly among public uh, figures. People like him a lot because I think of his, of his philanthropy. So, you know, a lot of uh, Americans, Americans like philanthropy. I, I think a lot of that is driven by uh, altruism, by the fact that they believe that it's right for people with a lot of money to give it away. Uh, I think a lot of Americans believe that philanthropy does a lot of good and uh, that business is a little tainted. But it's also out of just a sense of goodwill. I think that Americans generally believe that philanthropy is, is a nice thing. It's a good thing. Um, and uh, they, they support it and they, uh, they, you know, have a positive view of those wealthy who, who participate in, uh, in philanthropy. In, in the last few years, since 2010, 2010, uh, Warren Buffett and Bill, and, and, Steve, and Bill Gates, not Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, actually Steve Jobs did not participate in this day's credit, uh, both started something called the Giving Pledge. And the Giving Pledge was uh, this, um, this idea that uh, billionaires should, uh, this is primarily billionaires, should commit while they were alive to giving all their wealth away when they die, so that or a significant proportion, I can't remember the number, but it was 50%, 70, over 50%, I think, of their wealth would go to philanthropy, to charity uh, once they died. And I think this was an incredibly um, popular, popular initiative among the American people, and among a lot of people. And uh, a lot of wealthy people participated. Um, very few resisted the call uh, of the Giving Pledge. Uh, there's still some, I think it has over 170 uh, wealthy people from around the world who have committed to this Giving Pledge. And again, I think, I think the Giving Pledge itself, I think that the, the support for it, the, the, the general uh, positive view of it, are to a large extent reflections of the altruism in the culture and the need of businessmen to get some more credit to redeem themselves. We'll talk about that some more in a little bit to, to convince the world that they're really good guys. And the world reciprocates in that they view this as a positive thing and they give them a lot of moral credit, a lot of moral thumbs up go to wealthy business people who are also philanthropists. But what I've noticed, and, and, and this has always been the case, but I guess I've just noticed in the past, and, and Commentary Magazine has a big article today, or at least this week, on, on this issue, is that this trend towards mega philanthropy, if you will, billions of dollars dedicated to philanthropy by the richest people in the world, is actually coming, uh, you know, coming across some significant opposition and critique. Indeed, there's a new book out. It came out a few days ago um, 
by, uh, by Rob Reich, not Robert Reich, that's a, a different leftist, uh, by Rob Reich, who is a professor at Stanford University. He's indeed the university, he directs the University Center for Ethics in Society. So this is a guy responsible for ethics uh, in, at Stanford University, Ethics in Society. And he's out with a book called Just Giving, Why Philanthropy is Failing. No, sorry, I read that wrong. Why Philanthropy is Failing Democracy and How It Can Do Better. So why philanthropy is failing democracy and how it can do better. And um, there is a book review, basically, of the book in, uh, in Commentary Magazine. Uh, there's also a second book that's coming out, I think, early next year. Uh, it, that, is, uh, that is also very, very critical of modern philanthropy called Winners Take All, the Elite Charade of Changing the World. The Elite Charade of Changing the World, right? And then if, if you do a bit of Google search about critics of philanthropy, you'll find lengthy articles in The Atlantic and The Guardian and a bunch of other places by leftist intellectuals going after the philanthropists, attacking the philanthropists. So I thought it would be interesting because I think it, it's very revealing of a number of ethical points uh, and a number of uh, political points and a number of economic points just to go over, just to go over um, these kind of issues uh, and, uh, and discuss them and discuss what it is, what it is about philanthropy, what it is about philanthropy by the very, very rich, that is so offensive to, um, you know, to today's intellectuals. And I, I'll, give you, I'll give you a quick example, right? So um, Jeff Bezos, the man Donald Trump hates, turns out, and, and a lot of Donald Trump's friends hate, uh, supposedly this rabid leftist who supports leftist causes, it turns out is also hated by the left, right? It, uh, that's kind of curiosity. Many of the people hated by Donald Trump and his fans are also hated by the left. That's because a lot of commonality between Trump and the left. Anyway, Bezos has recently said he is donating $2 billion, $2 billion, it's a lot of money, a lot of money, to charitable organizations that do two things. Uh, well, to charitable organizations that provide food and shelter for the homeless. So he's trying to tackle the homeless issue by giving a lot of money to uh, organizations that help the homeless. And, and this is, this is kind of interesting from my perspective, but I'm not going to get into it here, but and to a new network of Montessori preschools in low-income areas, which I think is brilliant. So um, he is going to invest heavily in Montessori preschools in low-income areas, which I think, if, if you, if you want to help the poor, this is the best way you can help the poor. So, so I'm a, a huge uh, a, a supporter of that, right? And yet, these are two issues that the left loves, right? He's helping the homeless. This is good, right? And he's helping preschool. Right? I mean, the left has been about preschool education forever. Right? So these are two massive leftist progressive causes that you would think would generate applause and the left would say, yes, finally, a billionaire who gets it, who's supporting the things we believe in, who's going to make the world a better place by helping the homeless and by investing significantly in preschool education for poor kids. You would think that that would be the response. And yet, it's been at best, the response from the left has been at best muted, but more often it's been uh, negative. So it's been described as morally fraught, morally problematic in other words, and Slate, Slate, a, a, you know, solidly leftist, but not Salon, Slate, which is marginally more, uh, or significantly more, uh, I'd say respectable than Salon. Uh, Slate critic Jordan Weissman, he writes this about 
what Bezos has done. And, and this is going to fall under the first critique. There are going to be many, but this is the first critique uh, that the left has against the philanthropy of billionaires. Quote, while Bezos is busy trying to use his fortune to help the poorest of the poor, his company has become an almost perfect diorama. I don't know what diorama means, but a perfect diorama of American inequality from his own outrageous wealth, outrageous wealth, to the highly paid executives and tech employees, to the underpaid warehouse workers who often need to use food stamps to get by. Especially since so much of his wealth is tied up in the stock value of his company, every dollar Bezos gives away is in part a reminder that many of his workers could use a raise. Uh, in other words, Bezos made his fortune by exploiting workers. Therefore, his charitable donations are, you know, tainted, dirty, dirty. Now, this is a new, this attitude. This was the attitude that was expressed against Carnegie and against Rockefeller and against many of the philanthropists in the late 19th century, early 20th century. To quote Bob Reich, the guy who wrote this new book, and, and he supports this attitude, and he says, 100 years ago, uh, there was an enormous skepticism that creating a philanthropic entity was either a way to cleanse your hands of the dirty way you'd made money, you'd made your money, or more interestingly, that it was welcome from the standpoint of democracy. We'll get to the democracy aspect later. But notice, you want to... Uh, Oops. Uh, notice what he's saying, right? That you make the money in a dirty way. You make the money in a dirty way. And this is a way to cleanse your hands of it. And we're not going to let you do it. Because we're not going to forget that you made the money in a dirty way. Uh, in Rolling Stones, Ed Bermilla wrote, again, about Bezos' $2 billion contribution to causes the left should support. He wrote, Imagine people like Bezos and company like Amazon paid in practice anywhere close to the tax rate that applied to people of such great wealth in theory. So in theory, the tax rate should be much higher. And imagine if they paid that, right? He goes on, imagine if a company of such staggering wealth, 43 billion in revenues in a single quarter of 2017. By the way, notice the equivocation between wealth and revenue. Not the same thing at all. You can have $43 billion in revenue and lose money and not have any wealth. You have negative wealth. But put that aside, doesn't matter. Imagine if a company of such staggering wealth paid its employees enough to send their own kids to college. If that happened, College applicants might not need to pray for the goodwill of benevolent billionaires to afford an education. This was in criticizing Bezos' pledge. We pledged $33 million uh, earlier in the year to provide college scholarships for uh, dreamers, for so-called dreamers, you know, the, the, the kids of illegal immigrants who came, uh, who were born in this country. No, were not weren't born in this country, who were brought into this country very, very young. Right? Again, a leftist cause. No, 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 no. We don't want philanthropists to help because the philanthropists, their money is dirty. Their money is dirty. So the first reason why the left hates philanthropy is that they believe, is that they hate the wealth. They hate the wealth. They believe that the wealth is dirty, it's tainted, it's, it's ill-gotten. It doesn't belong to them in the first place. Remember, remember uh, President Obama's famous speech, his most important speech, maybe of his presidency, intellectually. You didn't build that. It's not yours. We should be taking a lot of this wealth away from them anyway. We should be taxing them. Taxes should be much, much higher. Much, much higher. And if taxes were much, much higher, they wouldn't have all these billions to give away. 
And the theory goes, if taxes were much, much higher, government would solve all the problems, and we'll get to that, that these billionaires are supposed to be solving, and they would have already been solved. They would have been already been solved. So reason number one is that it's tainted. And, and it truly is unbelievable, right? It truly is unbelievable, this, this notion of, uh, of tainted profits. It's, it, you know, this comes out in another article I found about Zuckerberg. So Zuckerberg gave, Zuckerberg gave some money to help people be able to afford housing in, uh, in Silicon Valley. And the, the idea was to help families in immediate crisis uh, while supporting research into new ideas for long-term solution to the housing crisis in Northern California. And his critics immediately pounced. But wait a minute, you're creating the crisis. You high-tech companies who are creating all these jobs in Silicon Valley, high-end jobs, high-paying jobs, valuable jobs, Jobs that are bringing in people who are willing to pay a lot of money for housing because they're making a lot of money. Creating demand for people to flow into San Francisco and the Bay Area because of all the economic activity these high-tech companies are creating. They, as a consequence, are driving up demand for housing. Now, put aside the fact that supply isn't being matched because of government regulation. Nobody ever talks about that. But you, by creating all this demand for housing, you, by creating wealth, you, by creating jobs, you, by creating economic activity, you're causing the housing crisis. The housing crisis is your fault. So of course you should be giving away your money to help solve it. But that's not the solution. I guess the solution is to shut down. The solution is not to create jobs. The solution is not to create economic activity, not to create wealth, not to pay people, all these employees. Maybe it's to move out of the area. Maybe it's to go to Nevada or to Texas. But the solution is, God forbid, we have economic growth. God forbid we have jobs. God forbid we have demand for housing. Because... It prices people out of the market. By the way, those of you in the chat, if you want to ask a question, you have to use Super Chat. Um, let, me, uh, let me finish this topic before I jump into a bunch of other topics. But if you want to ask a question about this topic, feel free to use the Super Chat. But I'm not reading the chat, and I'm not going to answer questions. Right? Uh, that I, I'm not going to answer questions that are not part of Super Chat. So, um, like Jeff Bezos and like, uh, like Zuckerberg, but on a much, 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 much smaller scale, I'm trying to, trying to make money. I'm trying to make money. So, I know Doug claims that there's distortion on the sound. Um, let me, let, I, okay, maybe if I yell, is that when there's distortions? Okay, I, I, I've reduced the gain, gain quite a bit, so um, let me know if, uh, if there is distortion. I want the sound to be great, so not, 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 don't say it's just okay. But is this better? If this is better, that's good. All right, sounds fine, sound not that bad. Not that bad is not good enough, because this also goes uh, up as a podcast, and much, somebody says much better. Okay, I reduced the gain, so maybe I'm yelling more today than usual. So um, uh, maybe that, and, and uh, somebody said, not too bad, but different. It's loud and tiny. What the hell? <laughs> I guess I just shouldn't ask, right? I shouldn't ask you guys because I get these crazy, crazy answers. Doug, who had the complaint, um, now he says it's okay, but loud. Sound is good. Okay, but uh, I don't know. I don't know what you guys want. All right. So, you know, so as I said, the first complaint is, and, but think about, think about the evil uh, of this. Right? There are no jobs. 
without the Bill Gateses, the Steve Jobs, the Zuckerbergs, the, the Bezos. There are no jobs. There is no economic progress. There is no economic success without entrepreneurs and businessmen. Rockefeller has to cleanse his hands from the dirt? Really? Really? This is what Teddy Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, who conservatives love, Teddy Roosevelt, who was, oh my God, the first really, really, really bad president, one of my worst five, although Obama and uh, Trump are making it hard to have a worst five. It has to be a worst seven now. Teddy Roosevelt said, quote, this is about, this is about the people who built America. This is about Rockefeller, who built America. Teddy Roosevelt, Republican, darling of conservatives, particularly neocons. They love Teddy. He wrote, he, he, he said, he announced, quote, no amount of charities in spending such fortunes can compensate in any way for the misconduct in acquiring them. Indeed, the way he made his money should actually disqualify him from engaging in philanthropy. Teddy Roosevelt, that's what he said about Rockefeller. One of the giants of American industry, one of the people who brought America into the 20th century and created the engine, the wealth that we have. Um, the president of the American Lab uh, Federation of Labor, Samuel Gompers. Now, you'd expect it from the American Federation of Labor, a socialist organization. But Teddy Roosevelt, I expect it because I've always labeled him as one of the worst presidents in American history, the first really, really bad president. Anyway, Samuel Gompers suggested, quote, the one thing the world would gratefully accept from Mr. Rockefeller now would be the establishment of a great endowment of research and education to help other people see in time how they can keep from being like him. <laughs> so Rockefeller should have, developed, should have invested his millions and millions and millions, billions really, in today's dollars in establishing a research and education institution to convince people not to be like Rockefeller. He did do that. Most entrepreneurs do that. It's called the American University. The American University is an institution devoted to making sure we don't have any more Rockefellers or Bezoses or, or, or Gateses. It's devoted to anti-capitalism, anti-individualism, anti-success. So actually, the American Federation of Labor got its wish. They got its wish. And this is the consequence. This is the early part of the 20th century. This is really the consequence of the progressives, the progressive teachings in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Teddy Roosevelt is the first progressive, progressive um, president. He actually establishes, he sp spins out of the Republican Party to establish a progressive political party. And uh, this progressive thinking, socialist thinking, collectivist thinking, but primarily collectivist thinking and statist thinking is, is really led to the identification of the, of the great industrialist of the 19th century as robber barons, as inherently, somehow inherently evil individuals. So this perspective on philanthropy has been with us from the beginning. This uh, perspective of philanthropy as unearned money that they shouldn't have to begin with, that is tainted and dirty, and that they shouldn't have the ability, the right to allocate it, to decide how to allocate it, even though, even though it's in the, it's, it's being used to promote the altruistic causes of the left, even though it's being done in the name of altruism by these philanthropist, that isn't good enough because of the way they got their money. The way they got their money is through capitalism, through 
business, through profit, and therefore by definition for the left, through exploitation. Does anybody think that if Jeff Bezos raised the wages of his employees, somehow, magically, he could overcome the laws of economics and do that? And if he was successful, the left would like him? No. Marxism, the, 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 the idea that profit is exploitation, that profit comes from exploitation, that profit equals exploitation, that idea is so ingrained in the DNA of the left today that it is impossible for them to, to view positively anyone who has vast wealth, and therefore they cannot view positively anything that the person like this might do with his wealth. All right, um, so that's reason number one, but I wanna, there are a few other reasons that I wanna go to, get to. So there are actually five given by Bob Reich, the Stanford, um, the Stanford whatever professor who is in the midst of Silicon Valley, who runs a center for ethics and society, teaching, teaching just as uh, Samuel Gompers wanted, teaching young Stanford students how not to be Rockefeller, how not to be an entrepreneur, how not to succeed, how not to make a profit, how not to be self-interested, how not to be pro-capitalist. This is what Bob Reich is doing at Stanford University in the midst of Silicon Valley. He actually outlines five additional reasons, additional to this primary, which is the hatred, the hatred of profit. Right? First, he says, big foundations, big foundations, are unaccountable. They answer neither to voters nor to the marketplace competition. So there is, there is no control. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, and it, well, let me go through all five of them because they all kind of add up to the same. So the first one is they answer neither to voter nor to marketplace competition. The second is they do not have to be transparent. They fill one tax form, and that's it. That's it. They don't even have to have a website. Wow, where's the government when you need it? Why can't the government? Why can't the government? Why can't the government just regulate this and, and get them to have a website? They should be forced to have a website. Third, the donor directed, the employees, the people on the ground can't determine the mission of the organization. And fourth, the donor's intent must be respected even when the donor has died. Societies grow and change, but the mission defined by the creator of the foundation remains the mission in perpetuity. Number five, I'll get to later because number five is a different issue. So what really pisses them off about these foundations is that they're not what they call democratic. Nobody has, nobody society, in quotes, the majority. Or in other words, pressure groups and politicians don't have a say in how the money is used. What really, really, really ticks them off is that here are a bunch of rich guys who not only made money by exploiting other people, by stealing and by dirtying their hands, but who now control vast amounts of wealth and can use that vast amounts of wealth to so-called better society based on what they think, what they want, based on their priority. <laughs> Here's a title from an from a editorial in The Guardian. This is the British newspaper. It's called, Wealthy Philanthropists Shouldn't Impose Their Idea of the Common Good on Us. <laughs> but it's okay for politicians to do it. It's okay for the majority to impose their view of the common good on a minority. It's okay for a group to do it on an individual. But God forbid wealthy philanthropists who weren't voted, who the intellectuals weren't asked about, who don't have to appease special interest groups and pressure groups, they impose their ideas of the common good in us. 
And the subtitle is Billionaire Donors Like Mike Zuckerberg and Priscilla Chang Have much power to define what is best for us We must decide if we are comfortable with that And they're not talking about here on Facebook They're not talking about the fact that They get to define Facebook No, they're talking about How they're going to use their philanthropy Which the other issue th that the left has with the left views philanthropy is much, much more important, much, much more important than, let's say, the, the, the wealth-generating engine that, is, that are free markets. What's really important is the philanthropic work. Markets, eh. All right. Um, I'll, uh, so I'll get to I'll get to your question in a little while. It's a good question. Um, so the thing that they really upsets them is the lack of control they have, and that voters have. Because to the 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 uh, leftist intellectuals hide behind the idea of democracy. They hide behind the idea that they can manipulate majorities, that they can manipulate the people and that the people would vote what they want. And in a sense, they do, right? Because the people do vote socialist policies over and over and over and over again. So everything drifts to the left because that's what the majority actually wants. But they're upset because here are people who get to make decisions for themselves. Here are people who actually decide how to use their money. And don't ask. They don't ask for permission. They just spend it. You know, whatever you think about many of these entrepreneurs, and I think a lot of the philanthropy they use is wasteful and stupid and ill-purposed. The one thing you can't deny is that most of them do kind of what they want to do based on their values or based on their perceived values or based on their own guilt, but they don't ask for consensus, although even that's not true. A lot of philanthropy, a lot of philanthropy is just follow the leader. It's a hood mentality. Indeed, I, I've read criticisms from all over the place that, that most philanthropy is just, is just a hood mentality. But it doesn't matter. What's dictating the hood, what's dictating the hood is the, the views, the views of a few billionaires who have money to dispose of. So what really pisses off the left is that they can't control how the money's used. What really pisses off the left is that often this money is used more effectively than their favorite programs. And what are their favorite programs? Their favorite programs are government programs. What ticks off the left is that there's suddenly competition to a government program. And they love a government program because a government program has a gun behind it. A government program is a force program. They, what they reject, what they, what they don't accept, is the idea that individuals can make decisions about their own values and should be able to do so in society. No, they say. If you've got a lot of money, we should be able to tax that money away so that we, in power, left or right, who are really, really, really smart, really, really, really smart, we can decide how to use that money for the greater good of society. We can decide how to use that money for the well-being of the human race. You, individuals, are not smart enough, and your incentives are corrupt because you're businessmen. You're greedy. You're selfish. You're, you're self-interested. If you're doing philanthropy, it must be because it's, it's, it's all about, I don't know, it's about redeeming yourself from all the evil you have done. It's about... PR, it's about public relations so you can make even more money than you have today. We don't trust you to dispose of this money. And since you didn't build it, therefore the money is not really yours. We, we could do a better job using it than you can. And who the hell are you to use it? Who the hell are you? So the left hates the fact that there's all this wealth and instead of it being allocated, dispensed by the state, 
by the state apparatus, which we all vote for, but is then controlled ultimately by the intellectuals in place and by the bureaucrats in place, who are motivated by altruism, motivated by the well-being of the people, now motivated by self-interest. Note, again, how self-interest and altruism guide all of these things. It's altruism to a large extent. It's the guilt, the unearned guilt that these philanthropists have to begin with that motivates them to give. And then it's the altruism that blames them for giving and tells them they don't give enough and they just should have never had the amount of money they claim to have to begin with. Because it's only self-interest could, could be the cause of such vast wealth and since self-interest is bad and evil, the wealth must be bad and evil as well. And the person accumulating the wealth must be bad and evil. But behind everything, behind every aspect of this issue, is altruism. Is the, re is the rejection of self-interest. The rejection of the idea of self-interest. The rejection of the idea that an individual should pursue his own values. The rejection of the idea that an individual should pursue his own happiness. Altruism fundamentally is the rejection of the idea that the individual sh morally has a right to pursue his own happiness. Your purpose of your life, the purpose of your life, is to serve others. Nothing else. <laughs> All right, so where the money comes from is tainted. Who gets to use it? The left is offended by the fact that these wealthy people are in a position to apply billions of dollars towards philanthropic activities instead of that money. Instead of that money, you know, um, being taken by government and used by them. All right. The third reason, of course, is that this is all tax subsidized. And I actually agree with this reason. <laughs> the one reason I have with regard to, I don't think philanthropy should be tax deductible. I don't think philanthropy should be tax deductible. I don't think anything should be tax deductible. I don't think government should use taxes and things to deduct or not to deduct, to manipulate social behavior. I believe the only way to tax, given that you have to tax today, is a flat tax with no zero deductions, exclusions, anything. They shouldn't try to get you to own a home by deducting interest. They shouldn't have you deduct anything, anything. So. Yeah, I believe there is, a, in a sense, I wouldn't call it a tax subsidy, but there's a tax benefit to giving philanthropy, and I think that's wrong. I think that's bad. I think it shouldn't exist. It's a distortion. It provides an incentive to take productive capital and deploy it in philanthropy when it might have better uses or the, 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 the giver might think it has better uses, if not, for the tax incentive that is provided by it. But it's not so much that there's a tax subsidy that they're offended by. It's that taxes on wealth are not much, much higher that really offends them. Right? Okay, so, I mean, it's amazing to me, right, that, that these, these great entrepreneurs can't win, right? Uh, you know, the right today hates them. Bezos is always on the list of most hated uh, people by Donald Trump and his ilk. The, uh, the right hates Zuckerberg, right? Because Zuckerberg has made a fortune off of Facebook and Facebook is, I don't know, is a leftist organization. Everybody hates these guys. And the left hates them. Even the left hates them, even when they then contribute their money to charity, even if they give it all like the Giving Pledge does, the left still hates them. And the reason they hate it is because you can't make that much money without being dishonest. My, my, my mother actually told me that a long, long, long time ago. When I was growing up, my mother said, 
All billionaires are crooks. All millionaires in those days are crooks. You cannot become a millionaire if you're honest. Now that comes, again, directly from the ideology of altruism, from the morality of altruism that says that pursuing your own values, that pursuing your own interest is tainted, is morally bad, morally evil. And therefore, anything you do which has this taint of self-interest, this perspective of self-interest, is going to be perceived as evil and bad. I, on the other hand, consider Rockefeller, Carnegie, J.P. Morgan, and, and the entrepreneurs from back then, Zuckerberg, um, Bezos, Jobs, Gates, and so on, as heroes. As heroes of production. A heroes of wealth creation. And it's none of my business what they do with their money. It's their money. They did build that. They did own that. It's theirs. They should be able to do whatever they want. Even if Zuckerberg wants to ban people, left, center, right. I don't care. It's his money. He can ban whoever he wants to ban. He can contribute to whatever causes he wants to contribute. It's not your money. It's his money. I believe in property rights. But I also believe that these people are true giants of production. And if you understand the objectivist ethics, if you understand the objectivist ethics, then being a productive genius you know, makes you a moral hero. Even if you disagree with me politically, even if you do things I disagree with with your money, even if you exclude me for your platform, it doesn't matter. What Zuckerberg did by creating Facebook, you can't wash that out. That doesn't disappear. The value of that does not just go away because he happened to, you know, deplatform a few people that I might like or not like or whatever. He's still a productive, creative genius from my perspective. I have a huge amount of respect for him. All right. Um, Let's see. Now, you can evaluate the philanthropy. You can say the philanthropy is bad, it's evil. They should. That's fine. You can evaluate what they do in their businesses, and you can say this practice or that practice is not legitimate. You know, go create a competitor and do a better job than they do. Right? But, you know, the, 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 I think the real tragedy is that the Gateses, the, the Zuckerbergs, the Bezoses, feel like they have to do all this philanthropy because they have to kind of wash, wash the guilt off of themselves. That's the real tragedy. Now, they would probably do philanthropy even in a rational world, but it would be different philanthropy. It would be focused on different things, and they wouldn't apologize for it. But I think that it is so revealing of the left's mentality, the, the kind of attacks uh, they impose on this, uh, on this. By the way, somebody says you know, Zuckerberg isn't banning people from the left. Well, isn't, it, isn't he? I mean, didn't, isn't there a big scandal right now about um, Facebook going after George Soros and investigating George Soros and trying to go after George Soros? Uh, you know, so. I mean, it's so simplistic to view this as left and right, and Zuckerberg doesn't like the right. I mean, the culture in, in the, the people who work at Facebook are, are mostly leftists. And the kind of leftists... Who, who don't tolerate dissent. That's the employees. So yeah, they're going to be more biased in that direction than anywhere else. But uh, there's a quote. I don't have the quote here from OPA, but there's a quote in OPA that, um, you know, at the end of the day, what counts is what you, how you live. Uh, and, uh, you know, what counts is what you produce. And... If you're a productive genius, then, yeah, you're not, a, you're not John Galt. John Galt is more than just a productive genius. But you are uh, Reardon, Reardon in the beginning of the novel, who doesn't get any of it. He's just, a, you know, producing, building, making. He's got lots of flaws. He makes lots of bad decisions. He gives money to bad causes. And yet, he's a massive hero, even at the beginning of the book, 
in terms of a productive genius, and that's what makes him all. And, you know, I encourage people to read OPA and to read the section on productiveness and to read the kind of the importance that uh, Lena Peikoff and ultimately Ayn Rand placed, uh, Ayn Rand placed on, um, on productive geniuses. And uh, no, I, I, I don't think anything Zuckerberg has done has, is reflects his opinion or anybody's opinion about free speech. Uh, the fact that he bans people from the platform is not a violation of free speech. Only entity that can violate free speech is government. Again, that's objectivism. All right, I'm going to take a few Super Chat questions. I, I said what I wanted to say uh, about, uh, about uh, philanthropy and, of course, uh, and about, you know, these billionaires. And, of course, it's often surprising to me the extent to which even people who follow me or, you know, uh, uh, dislike these uh, amazing geniuses. All right, here's a question from CEO, CEO Amaral. Doesn't freedom create wealth mostly because it attracts the most ambitious people to those freer areas, creating a disproportionately productive population? If the world was equally free, would it work as well? Um, no. So yes and no. No and yes. No and yes. All right. So doesn't freedom create, create wealth mostly because it attracts the most ambitious people to those sphere areas? No. No, 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 no. Freedom created wealth in 19th century Europe without net migration in. It created wealth by freeing up the minds of the people already living there. It's not that they are, that they are really, really smart people, ambitious people, all, there are no ambitious people in the United States. But then we establish freedom. There's still no ambitious people in the United States. People from overseas have to come in and, 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 and generate the wealth. No, it's, it, what freedom allows is for ambition, uh, ambitious people, but for the human mind to actually manifest itself, to actually, exp to actually allows it to flourish. It allows it to think and then act and experiment and try and, and produce, that's what freedom does. Freedom enables individuals, wherever they might live, to become incredibly productive, to innovate, to experiment, to try, to fail, to succeed. And that's how wealth is created. Wealth is created through the human mind. Uh, to, to create a wealth, what you have to do is free the human mind. Now, it's also true that if you, if, you create, if you have freedom, including the freedom to migrate, then your free country will attract the most ambitious population of immigrants who will then increase the amount of production and the amount of wealth being created in your, in your country. Right? It'll increase the amount of... Um, of uh, of wealth. But that is not the fundamental cause. The, 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 the fact that these immigrants come in is, is not the cause of the wealth production. The cause of the wealth production is the freedom of, and the freedom granted to the population already there. It, it's not necessarily this additional population that comes in. All right? Um, the second part is, if the world was equally free, would it work as well? Well, of course. Wow. If the world was equally free, if the world was free, then everybody in the world would have the ability to think, to produce, to experiment, to speak, to act, to live, and wealth creation would explode, explode. I mean, look at China. You give a little bit of economic freedom to 1.4 billion people, actually to, to a fraction of the 1.4 billion people who live in the areas where you've granted them freedom, granted them freedom, I mean, they, you should be free by birth, and look at the wealth creation, massive. Look at a place like Vietnam, look at every country. It's not that other people came into those countries, it's that you freed up the producers within those countries, and every human being has the capacity to be productive. Every human being has the capacity to produce under freedom. And that's, you know, that's what happens. 
when you create freedom. Freedom is primarily freedom of the mind, freedom to think and act on your thoughts, and it is that freedom that creates, that, that makes wealth possible. And, the, you know, not only that, because of the benefits of trade, because of the benefits of specialization, because of the scale you would get, if the whole world was free, then w the economies would be growing much, much faster. That is, let's say country A is free and country B is not free. Then country A will grow. But if country A is free and country B is free, country A will grow faster than it grew when country B was not free. This relates to my point about China and the, the fact that the U.S. economy has benefited enormously, massively, from, from China over the last uh, 30 years, 30-something 30 years, almost 40 years. The U.S. has benefited massively, massively, it's hard to measure how much, but massively, from the fact that China has become more free and we could trade with it. So the more free people there are in the world, the better off everybody is, including p those people who were free even before. Because now their freedom is, leverages over massive population and they can trade. Trade is a win-win. Trade benefits everybody, all the participants. So the more trade there is, the more beneficiaries they are, the greater the economic growth, the greater the economic success. Okay. Um, Jennifer asks, do you think politicians are envious of real producers? Yes, absolutely. I, I, I think, and I think cronies are envious of real producers. I think, and I think, of course, intellectuals are massively envious of real producers because they know this fundamentally, particularly leftist intellectuals, impotent intellectuals, incompetent imp intellectuals, they know that there, is, there are people here who are, who are competent in and successful in the world out there. They're competent and successful in what they do. And they're creating wealth. And all the intellectual can do is complain about it and argue for its redistribution. But they are haters and envious of the real producers. And I think most politicians are as well. You can see it in, in you could definitely see it in, in um, uh, what's his name, in uh, Obama, and you can definitely see it in Trump. I mean, Trump is totally envious of people like Jeff Bezos. Bezos is richer than Trump, and Bezos made it, made it himself, in a way that Trump cannot take credit for. Cannot take credit for. Um, is Facebook selling of user data dishonest? It's dishonest if it was not disclosed. It's dishonest if it went against the terms of, uh, of use. And I think there was probably some, I don't, I wouldn't say it was dishonesty, but some confusion um, w with regard to the Cambridge Analytica. Because I think in the, uh, look, and I've said this before, but I'll say it again. What Facebook is trying to do is incredibly complex. Set terms of use. I, I think the whole issue of who to deplatform and who to keep what are the terms? What are the conditions? Do you, do you allow people to say anything? Do you allow pornography? Do you allow, do you allow violence? Do you allow ISIS? Who do you allow and who don't you allow? Not easy at all to figure out. And then what do you do with the data? How do you do it? What, what do the terms of disclosure mean? How do they apply? When do they apply? Do they always apply? All of that is very, very complex and particularly complex when you're creating an industry that didn't exist before. So has Facebook made a lot of mistakes in that? Absolutely. Is Facebook an evil corporation because of that? No. Now, that doesn't mean Facebook wasn't dishonest on occasion. It might have been. I don't know. You'd have to research the particulars. But it depends on what are the, what are the terms of use. What, are they, what have they said in, in legal documents? What have they said publicly about the use of data and, and about... Who, can, who uses their platform, and, and how they've, they've used it. So you could, you could say that it's honest, but you'd have to prove it. All I'm saying is I think what they're trying to do is incredibly complex and hard, and it doesn't surprise me, doesn't surprise me, that they got some of it wrong, and that they will get some of it wrong, they are getting some of it wrong, and it's going to take 
a lot of iterations. They're inventing something that didn't exist before. And we on the sidelines, I mean, we on the sidelines are like these leftist intellectuals. Oh, we can do it better. We know how it should be done. They shouldn't depart from now. We should depart. We know what the criteria should be. How do you know? If you ever run a big corporation, you ever run a real business, have you ever had employees? Have you ever had customers who have all kinds of demands and employees who have a bunch of demands? Very few of the critics, both on the left and on the right, of these companies have any clue of what is entailed in running these companies and what is entailed in making these kind of choices and kind of decisions. Um, robust crypto, I don't answer questions unless they're super chat, so stop asking the same question over and over again. If you want an answer, put a couple of bucks on it. Okay, Enric Teller, is Facebook, oh, that, I've already did that. Uh, Brie, how do economists distinguish between growth and inflation? Well, it's hard. It's hard for them to distinguish and it's hard for them to measure. Um, inflation they measure in terms of uh, consumer prices or, or, or producer prices. They take a basket of prices and they see how much of uh, prices have gone up. Growth is measured primarily by things like growth domestic product. That is the amount that is being produced and consumed in the economy. To what extent is that increased? And that number is always adjusted for inflation. So if inflation is 2% and growth is 2%, then growth is, is reported as zero. Right, so it's adjusted, I'm, I'm being simplistic here, but it's adjusted for inflation. So the growth numbers are always growth, in a sense, minus inflation, that you hear, economic, when they say economic growth, the economy grew by 3% last quarter, that means it grew by 3% after taking into account inflation. And inflation is measured by CPI. Now, none of those are good measures. Inflation, according to Austrian economists, is basically the printing of money. And, so it's not really what it does to prices because you can have inflation printing of money without prices going up or only with select prices going up, some prices in the economy, so a basket wouldn't capture it. In a free market, there is no inflation really. Nobody's interested in measuring it really. Um, there's sometimes a little, prices might go up a little bit, prices might go down a little bit depending on the supply and demand for gold. But generally, Inflation is not something one worries about in a free market. And economic growth, while the economist might want to measure it, in a free market, of course, the economy grows. Not every sector grows. Not in any area it grows. What you re I mean, the whole perspective in economics that an individualist has is how am I doing? Do I have a job? A job prospects for me in the future positive. And that is related to some extent how the economy is doing. But it's much more individualistic, much more focused in terms of the areas that are interested me, the areas where I am invested in, the areas where I have particular abilities in. How are those doing? Uh, rather than looking at these macro numbers, which I think are less significant. Okay, oh, he says, my macroeconomics professor said the Federal Reserve ended the constant bank runs of the late 19th and 20th centuries. That's true. It's true. They, uh, well, it wasn't the Federal Reserve that ended the bank runs. I mean, that's so, he, so your macroeconomics professor is wrong because the Federal Reserve was established in 1914. There were bank runs all the way until 1933. So that it was not, you can go back to your macroeconomics professor and tell him he's full of it. It wasn't uh, the Federal Reserve. What ended the bank runs, and it didn't really end them, but I'll talk about that in a minute. What ended the bank runs as we saw them in the movies and as we've read about in the books is the positive insurance. Insurance ended the bank runs. And that was in student 1933 by FDR. And it was, whoops, what happened? There it goes. And it was basically, basically it says that your deposit in a bank or insured by the federal government. So there's no point in running on the bank because the government will bail you out. The FDIC will bail you out. So don't worry. Be happy. It doesn't matter if your bank goes bankrupt or not. You are safe. So it ended constant bank runs was deposit insurance. Government deposit insurance. Now, it didn't really end bank runs. It ended a certain type of bank runs. 
What happened in the, 20th, in the late 20th century in the SNL crisis, in the banking crisis during the SNL crisis, and then in 2008, is you got more sophisticated bank runs. You got bank runs on uninsured deposits. So insured deposits used to be only over the first $10,000 in your bank. Today, they're up to $250,000 in your bank. But what if you have 10, 000, what if you have $10 million in the bank? What if you lent the bank $10 million? And now you're worried about a bank, like Lehman Brothers. You take your $10 million out, and you don't lend it back to the bank. So you... Um, so the bank runs still exist today. 2008 was basically a bank run. Lehman Brothers was a bank run. Morgan, uh, uh, Bear Stearns, uh, 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 Merrill Lynch, all these investment banks that went bankrupt were bank runs. Right? Even some of the, even the SNL crisis was basically a, a, a uh, you know, it was, it, there it was more a decline in the value of the assets. The, 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 the loans went bust. But in the case of Lehman Brothers in 2008, it wasn't. The loans were fine. It was that they couldn't raise money. They couldn't get liabilities so they, because there was a, a run. They, they, everybody withdrew their money from it. And that's why the Federal Reserve Institute is too big to fail. And the whole idea of too big to fail was deposit insurance over mega deposits for the big banks. So if you're a big bank, you're basically insured up to a gazillion dollars. It doesn't matter how much money you have in the bank. That's why if I ever have more than $250,000 in a bank account, I immediately move that deposit to one of the big banks. So I don't mind having $10 million in Bank of America because Bank of America is too big to fail. So basically, so basically, I have deposit insurance ad infinitum at Bank of America, at Citibank, at, at, uh, at Wells Fargo, at the big, big, big banks. That's what too big to fail is. That's what too big to fail is. All right? So now in a free market, you don't need deposit insurance. In a free market, the market would establish mechanisms to deal with bank runs. But since there's never been a free, ma uh, free market in banking in the United States, there was one in Scotland, there was one in Canada, but there's never been one in the United States, the fact that there were bank runs in the late 19th century, early 20th century, does not is not an, uh, a, a condemnation of free markets. It was a condemnation of the regulatory regime on banking that existed in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, a true free banking regime would have very little, very few bank runs. There would be private deposit insurance. There would also be all kinds of banks, 100% uh, reserve banks, all kinds of banks that actually prevented um, bank runs. Bank would also be really diversified and much more liquid than they are today. So there'd be a lot of banking industry would look very different in a free market than it looks today. All right. Um, Any other uh, Super Chat questions, or we'll call it a day. We've gone an hour and three minutes. Um, and uh, all right. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody. And um, let me just remind you all to, if you like the show, share it. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. And, of course, if you can, I'd very much appreciate your support, particularly at the beginning of the month. Um, and towards the end of this year on the Patreon channel. Uh, you know, I have to, have to make decisions about next year and about the show and about what to do with it. A lot of that will be determined by the support that I think I'm going to get from you guys over 2019, since we're really coming to the end of 2018. Anything you can do to support the show, to show that the show is important to you and uh, that we should continue, expand, um, invest more in the show, the best way for you to show me or, or to reflect that is one, send me comments, and B, make a contribution on Patreon. So thanks, everybody. And uh, I think the next show is on Monday. So I'll see you all on, uh, on Monday. I do. I have some Patreon questions 
that I, uh, I promised to get to. I've got another four questions. I'll probably do those on Monday.